Exactly. And what would then also be added as necessary to the levels one through four are the services and supports. You layer on top. That you layer on top okay. and that the budget funds the what we call the services and supports line item, which is essentially ultimately funded out of the reduced cost by not being in, a, in, a, in congregate care, but recognizing that there's a transition process involved, basically upfronts the availability of those services to make it possible for the shift to be occurring. Um, the rest of the comments that I'm going to make, I need to preface by just reminding us that we are in a Proposition 30 environment. Mm -hmm. And so what we are trying to do through the budget is fund what we think are the new services that are being demanded by the legislation that are above that which is already required pre-realignment. The child welfare program was realigned to the counties. All of the, virtually all of the state general fund that had supported it was transferred to the local revenue fund, which has a growth factor attached and da 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 da. That funds the pre-existing responsibilities that the counties had. CCR, maybe four or three, has the effect of creating some new requirements or accelerating others. Let's use resource family approval. It accelerates what was a pre-existing legislated mandate. And so there's a recognition of the acceleration of, that the counties have to accomplish by state funding increases there. Um, it needs, um, obviously a, a major effort at identifying relatives, engaging them, meeting their immediate needs, getting them into the system, as well as potentially non-relative foster parents. I keep starting with relatives because I think that's where we have to focus. Um, foster family recruitment was a pre-existing requirement on the counties as was the federal and state requirements that children be cared for in the lowest, least restrictive environment. Mm -hmm. However, this process, which sort of has a prospective end date for the availability of lower level group care, clearly accelerates a need. So there, the state is proposing in the budget to fund that acceleration um, so that the supply is created. Th there would be an expectation on the state's part that when that sort of hump has been crossed, then potentially it, it reverts to being county um, primary responsibility. The child family teams, although counties have started doing child family teaming as part of the KDA lawsuit settlement um, and other um, core practice model innovations the counties have been at their own volition developing over the last few years, and very good innovations. Um, truthfully, those were not a requirement. And so because CCR has the requirement for CFDs, the state is proposing to fund them. There's, we don't have a lot of history or experience yet with what it actually is. So. Good, honest people can say it should be five hours a session or six hours a session or, or whatever. Ultimately, we're going to have to reality base our budgeting as we keep moving forward. Um, there's no way around that. There's, there's no perfect theorem or formula I can get us to. Mm -hmm. In terms of the social worker rate, the Realigned programs have been funded, I th I'm doing this from memory, I think it's at the old rate of 72, 60 an hour for social workers. Mm -hmm. And the state's perspective is that the increased cost of that is something that's funded through the realignment growth component, um, the growth in the sales tax revenue. Clearly, there are new activities here that are outside of the realignment pot. So those are being funded in this budget for assumption purposes at $85 an hour mm -hmm. with the understanding that we'll be looking at the actual December claims, um, which is sort of our mid-year point, seeing what the real numbers look like 
for the costs in these activity areas that we're increasing the funding for. And then we'll have to do some truing up as we keep moving forward. Th there is, and it's within the core legislation, the process of truing up not just statewide, but to make our lives really complicated. Proposition 30 requires us to true up increased costs versus potential savings on a county by county basis. And then at some point as we're moving into the future, the state investment can change according to what realized savings are. So I, th this is to sort of say it's, it's a complex set of moving, intersecting issues. Mm -hmm. I think we have budgeted fairly. Um, it's certainly the intent to have budgeted fairly. Um, the, we, you, you don't want to overshoot, you don't want to undershoot, you're trying to find, you know, just warm enough. Um, and again, as we actually get claiming information, as we get into the fiscal year, we'll see, our, have we hit it directly. And, and if you see that you have not, what would you then do? I think it depends in, in which area. I mean, if, if it is, in something that conceivably can be handled by simply adjusting the ramp up speed or something, that would be one thing. If we see that we've got a critical problem elsewhere, we'll have to be sitting down with our colleagues in the administration figuring what other remedies. I mean, there's a commitment to make this work. Um, at the same time, we have a responsibility to be um, realistic in, in, in terms of assumptions we're trying to make. Um, the so, I'm sorry, let me stop there before I... If the legislature doesn't approve the new rate structure, what would then happen? The r rates are not actually in legislation. They're administrative. What we are asking the legislature to approve is the budget, which will fund what, I mean, we're indicating what we think the rates should be. Obviously, we are in dialogue now, the, the budget's in public, we couldn't dialogue before the budget was released. Now we're dialoguing. Um, our hope is, my hope is, my request, is that the legislature adopt our budget um, and then let us work through the implementation process of what is fundamentally a very complex moving process. Senator Bonney? <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Senator Not only is it complex, Madam Chairman, uh, but I want to just uh, say how much I appreciate your historical. It, it, it was not relevant because I was wrong. I was I was over here in the orange grove and he's growing apples. So I. <laughs> still have a historical perspective that's very valuable on this committee, and I want you to know how much I appreciate that. Thank you, Senator Stone. I appreciate you. Um, if I could ask one more question, because I'm, I'm trying to get my back, myself back on the right base. The chart, figure one on page 21 of the agenda, which shows your estimate of the number of foster children who are in home-based family care to, today, and how they would then fall into your four levels of care. To, to paraphrase uh, Deputy Director Greg Rose, who is over in the Eastern Sierra Counties briefing with um, local leaders there on this, um, there's as much art as science. We start by using the KDA documented information that we have in our systems mm -hmm. that sort of indicate what are the subclass numbers who are eligible for um, various levels of child family teaming and, and other sorts of services as well as in need of higher levels of um, intervention and therapeutic care and then make some assumptions based on that. Um, it's prop, for, for now it's I think about as close as we're going to get. Um, we, when we have been through the whole sort of year of Redetermination of not not sorry not redeterminations, but every six months there is a court review of each case, and that at minimum will be triggering the child family team and the sort of 
assessment of the, of the circumstances of a given child. Additionally, um, crises occur, caregivers call, um, caregivers say, I'm going to send a seven day notice unless we work something out here. All of that can trigger it. Mm -hmm. It will take though a whole cycle before we really see where this lands. Um, so this, this is a budget estimating um, device. Because this doesn't reflect children that are currently in congregate care settings. It would so this equals 100% based on my math. It, it's the percentage, 100% right. that the title of the column is those, I'm sorry. <clears throat> the title of the column is the percentage of all children in home-based family care. So it's excluding those in group homes. Right. That's correct. Because of it, the assumption is, is that the children who are in group care who start moving down are probably going to higher levels of care um, over the course of the couple of years. Okay, I'm gonna have to, this, all right. LAO. Uh, good afternoon, Madam Chair, Ben Johnson from the Legislative Analyst Office. Uh, as we know, the governor has released a May, his May revision, and it does include new estimates of the CCR proposal, totaling over $127 million in, in spending for CCR implementation. Uh, this is an increase of over $60 million more than the January proposal. Um, as has been readily discussed already, the one major difference between the January and May estimates is the inclusion of a new rate structure and new rates that will be paid to the foster care caregivers and providers, um, the structure of which um, uh, has been explained. And overall, we, we find that the May revision provides more refined estimates of the costs of CCR implementation. Um, while it, while May Revise has provided added clarity, uh, uncertainties remained about both the costs of CCR implementation and how it's ultimately gonna work in practice. Um, and rates offer a, use, a useful example here. Um, we have yet to learn certain details of how uh, level of needs assessment is going to t determine what different uh, level of care rate each child is going to receive under the new structure. And moreover, we. We really can't know at this time how that's gonna work out in practice until after implementation uh, occurs in January. So we don't know who is going to be a level four versus, versus a level one. And um, yeah, that seems to be where we are today. Um, so, but ultimately how this new rate structure uh, works in practice is going to have an important impact on foster parents' access to resources and services and to the ultimate general fund costs in 2016, 17, 17, 18, and, and perhaps beyond. So in light of these uncertainties for which rates is just one example, um, the legislature might want to consider what kinds of oversight it would like to put in place uh, to oversee this implementation. Uh, we believe the oversight could help ensure, one, before implementation, uh, readiness on the part of DSS, counties, and foster care providers uh, for when CCR does go live, and then two, to help ensure that the rate system, that the child family teaming process and so forth achieve the objectives and outcomes uh, that legislators envisioned when they passed CCR. So uh, thank you and I'm available for, to answer any questions. Finance, public comment. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and members, Tia Orr on behalf of the Service Employees International Union, again on um, behalf of our 10,000 social workers statewide. We obviously see a huge amount of progress in the May revision um, as compared to the January proposal. We have been engaged with conversations with DSS. We just recently met with them this morning and unfortunately haven't had the chance to vet it and discuss it as, as detailed as we need to. I think at first glance, we see that there needs to be maybe some improvement on the CFT side, on the ch child family teams. We think this is an essential part of the CCR and making sure that we have attention to the staff time that it's going to take for us to materialize this, we think is, is very, very important. Also, I think we've talked a lot about the rate structure. Happy to see the rate structure in there, but do believe that there is a lot more work that needs to be done and some details that need to be answered for us to feel comfortable with the proposal before you. Thank you. 
Good afternoon, Madam Chair and members. I'm Farrah McDade-Ting from the California State Association of Counties, representing all 58 of California's counties. Uh, I do want to echo uh, Ms. Orr's comments that uh, the May Revise reflects a significant amount of work by both the DSS and DHCS, as well as Department of Finance and others, to try to, as Director Lightborn said, get warm, get in the ballpark of what we think we might need. There are still a lot of unanswered questions. It's really hard to figure out what we might need when we, we don't know yet what is going to happen. Um, we also agree with the LAO's comments about oversight. Are we ready? What are some of the gate posts or things that we need to keep an eye on to see that we're ready and to make sure that children aren't falling through the cracks? We also have significant uh, work to do on county collaboration at the local level between the different departments that touch a foster child's life. And um, I would do want to say, Madam Chair, that um, we are all wandering in this orchard <laughs> of many different fruits and trying to figure out what is where. And I just learned today as well about the difference in rates for both the uh, group care and foster homes. So it's a learning process. Um, everybody's working very hard to see if we can get close. We do have concerns about being ready for January 1, but I think um, everybody has those concerns. So we look forward to working, continuing to work on it. Thanks. Thank you, Madam Chair. Frank Mecca, Executive Director of the County Welfare Directors Association. If I could talk about sort of the administrative work of child welfare agencies first and then uh, a moment on rates. Um, with respect to the, the work associated with child and family teams, the resource family approvals, and foster parent recruitment retention and support, as Mr. Lightborn said, there's a substantial increase from the January budget, and that's the product of very productive conversations we had with the administration for which we're, we are grateful. Um, th we do believe, and we're asking the legislature um, and the administration to support a small augmentation above what's in the May revision for child and family teams. Um, it's $3.4 million general fund in uh, the budget year. Essentially, the question comes down to how long does it take the staff to do a really good team meeting? And the best practice standard from our folks um, and people that we've talked to in, in other venues, in, in including different parts of the department, is 10 hours. And that includes the time for a facilitator and the time for a social worker. And this is for the vast majority of cases. Some take less and some take more. And we agree sort of on the um, idea that there are differences based on the acuity of the case. But for the majority of the cases, we got close uh, with the department, but we got to the point where the, de um, the administration's budget is based on six hours. We believe eight hours is the minimum, and that's both for the social worker and for the facilitator. That doesn't sound like a lot, but, it, but the quality of that child and family team is really key to the success mm -hmm. of CCR. We would also ask the administration and the legislature for $2.4 million general fund for the budget year to pay for the resource family approval work at our current cost. Mr. Lightborn indicated that the budget does increase the social worker cost for child and family teams and agrees to true that up going forward. And we're very grateful and pleased for that. We believe under Proposition 30 that that same updated cost applies to the resource family approval work. The fact that that work is a, was accelerated into the budget year, we believe requires um, under the Prop 30 calculus that the, st the state fund that. And we also agree that this is all subject to a back end true up where the state looks at the costs and savings and those, that, uh, those initial upfront investments could be offset by county savings. And we appreciate that that, that is part of the, the going forward process. Um, we support well, sort of the notion that the LAO discussed and the notion we've discussed with the department about putting good mechanisms in place to monitor almost in real time how it's going. Um, how are, both from a process standpoint and from an outcome standpoint, are families being recruited, are, are families getting mental health services, are providers coming into the market? Um, just to, to have that type of information that we can provide to you because we are, we know we're embarking on this grand experiment with the best sense that we have, but we know mid-course corrections are absolutely are gonna have to be made along the fly. 
On rates, it's a more it's a more complicated question for us. We had we had hoped that rates would be released in March, which was under the original schedule, so that we would have a couple of months to wrestle with them um, before you were asked to make a decision. And um, we don't have the benefit we don't have the benefit of that time, and we do have some concerns about the rates. I should say that. We appreciate that they're higher, and we appreciate that they've moved toward a child-centric sort of sort of approach. I mean, the, struct the structure is there. We have concerns about whether or not the resource family rates, as the level of care goes up into those four categories, whether the increments grow in sufficient amounts mm -hmm. to really allow that family or relative caregiver to take care of children that have more intensive that have more intensive needs. Mm -hmm. We'd hoped for some greater regionalization, if not total regionalization, to be able to have a rate system that's more accommodating to differences in the costs um, across the state. And the rate system, as we understand it, it's proposed, still does rely to a certain degree on the counties themselves sort of patching on top of, with their own sort of additions, the rate system. Um, so, so what we're struggling with mostly is sort of the the process from here on out. We understand that the legislature is being asked to adopt a budget, and the administration uh, um, is sort of regulatorily working on the rate system. We just need to agree to continue to have the discussions, we think, to make those more immediate tweaks um, on the rate side, and then to have the sort of the broader discussion about how perhaps the rate system can evolve over time as the rest of CCR evolves over time. and. Um, Given sort of the late date, we have to figure out how that process is going to work. Um, but we did want to at least give you the benefit of our initial thinking at this point. Thank you. Appreciate that. Next witness. Carol Schroeder with the California Alliance of Child and Family Services. I want to uh, echo Mr. Uh, Mecca's last remarks as his conclusion is sort of the lead in to, to actually to, to some of my uh, uh, concerns. Um, uh, as you know, we received the, the budget, uh, the proposed rate system on Friday. We weren't able to even talk to our members about it until Monday. And so they've only had a chance to take a look at that, uh, you know, over the past day to get some sense of, of whether or not they think the adequacy uh, or the rates are adequate to do the things that we want them to do under CCR. Here's our first take. We're appreciative of the higher rates that are in there, both for STRTPs and for, uh, for foster family agencies under the levels of care. Our concern is that the rate system as it is uh, funded and structured in here is probably only going to partially fund what CCR envisioned. And I want to address two things. First, the levels of care that you uh, spoke to, Madam Chair, and then secondly, the SDRTPs. Um, on the, uh, the levels of care, we're, we're really unclear about how the various levels of care were calculated. Uh, we proposed some rate schedules to, uh, uh, to CDSS some time ago, four or five months ago, maybe six months ago, with, with some pretty uh, extensive uh, background on, on how we got to them. And while the structure is reflected in the current rates, uh, the, the, this current rate proposal, the, the, the amounts are not. Um, we're particularly concerned about the amount for services and support. And, and I'm looking, and I, I was really surprised to, to look at the analysis today and see that uh, uh, there's, a, there's an, uh, an estimate on page uh, 21 that 55% of the kids in, in care uh, or in, in home-based family care uh, are at LOC1. And then if you go to page 20, you'll see that LOC1 uh, under item B here in this chart has no need for services and support, zero. One of the central tenets of, of CCR was to assure that kids, regardless of where and with whom they live, get the services and support they need. And it's incomprehensible to me that 50% of those kids will not need the core services that are, that are detailed in, uh, in, uh, in AB 403. We also don't understand the minimal changes in rates between the various FFA levels, which, uh, which Mr. Mecca uh, also spoke to, both in terms of the amount that's provided for the resource families, but also the amount provided for uh, social, services, uh, social services and support. Um, regarding STRTPs, there hasn't been a meeting with stakeholders on the STRTPs since 2014. So there really hasn't been any substantive input into the, R into the STRTP rate. You'll recall RBS reform, residentially based services reform, and the, for those four, prior, four of the projects are still in existence. 
one of the things we learned from that is that the, uh, that the, the way that residential services work uh, and the only way that they work is if there are follow along uh, support and services with that young person as he or she returns to the community and returns to family. That's missing from the SDRTP proposal. There are, there's a rate for the residential component and the family work and the stuff that's done there, but once the child's uh, discharged from the residential component, there's no uh, provision for the follow-along support and services, which, uh, uh, which R RBS reform taught us was essential. Um, there is one level for SDRTP, and we think that on average that's probably about right in terms of the amount of money, but we think that there are populations of youth that will have higher need and will require a higher rate, and populations of youth that have lower need and will require a lower rate, but both of whom will require um, uh, some period of time in residential, uh, residential care. Um, we are unclear how you design a rate structure around level of need when there is no level of need. Mm -hmm. So if, if the level of care is reflective of the level of need and the level of funding is reflective of the level of care needed, it's unclear to us how you do that without the, the, uh, the mechanism for determining that. And so it's really hard to know in many respects whether or not this is sufficient because there is at this point no, no measure for that. There's no way of determining that. Um, and um, and, and uh, finally, I'd say that uh, there's no mechanism for the review of those rates to determine ongoing adequacy. Uh, I, I, uh, I, I'm sad to say that California has a, has a horrible reputation, a horrible history of, uh, of allowing rates to decay, 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 and then wringing our hands and saying, oh, why has, level, why has the, the you know, care uh, and the, the care provided kids fallen so horribly without ever saying, well, it's because we've allowed the rates to decay. And so you know, we would strongly recommend that this rate system include some mechanism for review of those rates periodically to determine their adequacy. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hi, Susanna Niffen with Children Now. And I agree with the speakers who've come before me. I also worry about the sufficiency of the rates, uh, the service and supports dollars, especially the level of care one. Uh, like Carol mentioned, it's still very unclear how assessments will inform level of care and how we're gonna slot kids in. And these are all things that I think we need to work out. I do wanna stop for a minute though and just say that for children and for families specifically, maybe not the systems, maybe not the providers, but for those people, this is an incredible and historic change. And I just wanna th say thank you to the department for really hanging in there through a lot of hard conversations and getting to a place where we're starting to create a system that actually matches the needs of a child to the rates and services we provide rather than a placement. I'd also like to say that for the first time, we're actually providing equity for relatives as long as the trailer belt gets fixed, which we've already talked about and I am assured it will. Um, you know, this is the first time we've done that in California and I'm pretty sure in the nation. And so there's some really historic stuff in here that I don't wanna lose in the fact that some of the details may not be worked out. And given that the department has moved so far in a direction that is positive for children and families. I'm really hopeful that they will continue those discussions and raise these rates to a place where they are sufficient and that all of these things will be worked out um, and we'll continue to both fight and work with them to make sure that that happens. But just don't lose that this is pretty historic. Agreed and thank you. Next witness. Good afternoon, Molly Dunn with the Alliance for Children's Rights. And I wanna echo what um, Susanna just said, that this is a huge step forward for our relative caregivers. For the first time in our state's history, we will have a rate structure that provides relative families the exact same rates that would be available to any other foster parent. And we really appreciate the department's work to get that structure in place. And um, it will serve our relatives so well who are really the backbone of our child welfare system. Um, we also do appreciate the the um, work on correcting the uh, ARC uh, TBL, um, and we look forward to seeing those revisions happening um, very quickly. Uh, like others, we're still examining the rates themselves. Um, while the structure um, is something we are very supportive of, we still need some time to look at whether or not the rates proposed are sufficient to meet the special needs of, that many of our foster children have. Um, and the you know, final thing that I would note is that the proposal does not address the child care needs of our foster families, and that's really, really key to be able, being able to recruit and retain um, foster families, and um, will be really necessary to make sure that CCR implementation is effective. Um, but those minor issues aside, this is a, a historic leap forward for our relative foster families and we thank the department for their work. Thank you, next witness. 
Yes, Madam Chair, members, Julie Navoris on behalf of the Urban Counties of California. I rely on my comments with CSAC and CWDA. I think we are very appreciative of the additional funds and may revise um, for the CCR. But as you know, this crosses over several county departments and we're still, I think, going through analyz analyzing and making sure we have the appropriate funds to make this work in January. We wanna ensure, as I think Director Lightborn said, that even if we don't get to that special place where we find the exact dollar amount, we can still continue to have these conversations and not have the door closed on us just because it's not in this budget cycle. Thank you. Thank you. Final witness. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and members. Usha Mutchler on behalf of Chief Probation Officers of California. I also align my comments with our county colleagues. Um, we do uh, appreciate and support the governor's um, investment in CCR, but we do want to note that we also have concerns about um, the true cost of implementing CCR, as we really don't know how much it will cost on local level to implement this. Um, we too have looked at the rate structure and it's really too early to uh, make a final analysis as to whether the rate structure will work. But we are also um, very um, happy that this uh, huge step has been taken and we hope that you support the proposal. Thank you.